Uh, we'll start in Proverbs 22.6 because my mothers are definitely special to us. You know, and uh, I think uh, for, our, for our family, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's, I believe dads, you know, dads are important too, but it's the mothers that give that love, that they nurture, that it's the first relationship that a child ever develops is with their mom. It's carried inside the mom for nine months. I mean, that there's good data out there today that supports if you've not developed a relationship with your mom, uh, you're probably gonna have trouble de developing relationships with people your whole life. It's so important, that first relationship, and teaches us so much about Christ. But uh, today we start with Proverbs 22, 6. He says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart, not depart from it. And then I want you to turn to Proverbs 31. If you're a, a mom today, not read Proverbs 31, I would encourage all moms to read Proverbs 31, but I'll read Proverbs 31, 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. I think it's important that we see that moms raise their children on the gospel of Christ. They raise them up and they will not depart from it. One, they might, you know, they're going to depart for a while, not depart from the gospel, but they're probably going to go into the worldly ways a little bit. But ultimately, they know they can never lose their salvation. Ultimately, they'll come back and grow up, continue to grow in grace. And one day, they'll look at their moms and say, you are blessed. Thank you, Mom. And I thank my mom. I wrote her a mother's card today, and that's one of the things I wrote in the mother's card is I thanked her for allowing her, allowing me to go to a Bible camp that actually taught the gospel message. Where I could hear as a child that I'm a sinner, I deserve to go to hell. There's nothing I could do to earn salvation. It's not a partnership, but it's by faith alone. Christ Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father today. It is an empty cross. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. The thief on the cross did not get down to get water baptized. The thief on the cross trusted in Christ alone. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be in paradise. And that's the message that I was taught growing up. And I loved reading the scriptures, going to those, you know, that the camp and reading about Jesus Christ, what he did for us. And over and over showing that it's man's faults. From day one, we've fallen short. And over and over in the Bible, there's so many pictures of, the, of Christ in the Bible. So let's go back to Hannah. Let's go back to 1 Samuel. Because we're going to read about a young lady who could not get pregnant. And you know what? She went to the Lord in prayer and... And she, her husband was Elkanah, and he had two wives, and one was, had many children, and she, she actually would antagonize Hannah. And you know, Hannah could have become resentful herself, but you know what, what we're going to see what Hannah does. And as moms here, and future moms in the room here today, we can, grab, we can find so much encouragement from a young lady named Hannah. So we read here, and 1 Samuel 1, 1 and 2. Now there was a certain man of Remetham, Sophim, of Mount Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephratite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Paneah. And Paneah had children, but Hannah had no children. We have polygamy documented here in the Bible, but that's not what God's plan was. God's plan was never to have polygamy, more, never to have more than one wife. It is marriage started in the institution. God gave man the institution of marriage in Genesis 2.24. And it's one man, one woman. And it says, Therefore shall a man leave his wife, leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So we see a problem here right with Elkanah. And it causes problems in the family. That's why polygamy is... Uh, not uh, is probably is uh, ultimately frowned upon because we see the jealousy happening between the wives here. So we go on to verse 3. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. It's interesting that they use the word Shiloh here because Genesis, Genesis 49, 10 says, you know, the scepter shall not depart until the Shiloh come, which we're talking of Christ. Peace. The Messiah, right here, and here they go. They go up to offer sacrifices up in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and 
Phineas, the priests of the Lord, were there. We know Eli's sons were very evil, and you'd have to read very first Samuel to continue, but that's not what the message is about. We see here Elkanah. What's he do? He goes up here and he offers offers a worship and sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts. The Lord of Sabbath. And ultimately, from Adam unto the Old Testament, from Adam all the way through the Old Testament, we see people offering up sacrifices of faith. It is not the sacrifice that saved them. Because we even from Adam, what did he do? They gave a burnt offering right then and there. And we see Cain and Abel. When Cain killed Abel, Cain actually did the labors of the ground and he offered up fruits on the Lord and Abel offered up a sacrifice. And he ultimately Cain was envious and he was trusting his works where they were already looking for the Messiah because Genesis 3.15 is the first ultimately we're talking about the coming Messiah. So these people, and I love these verses, the verses, Lamentations. If you know our Lamentations, Jeremiah wrote this and he lamented over the tribe, the ten tribes of Israel. If you turn over to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you find the, the prophets, we like Daniel and Isaiah, we got the major prophets just after the book of Jeremiah. We got five little books, and Lamentations is ultimately a book of grieving, and he lamented over the nation of Israel because they were worshiping pagan gods. They were offering up idols uh, or sacrifices to false gods, and it's the same problem today, and we should lament over our nation, the United States, where we're living in a society today that talks about ecumenalism, where we're seeing men that were grounded in grace, and we see them today falling for a false message. That, you know, and, oh, maybe it's true that uh, everybody goes to heaven. No, it's not. When they say things like, you know what, a true believer won't turn their back on God. Well, you know what, to me, you're saying then you're holding on to your salvation. You're saying it's a works for salvation, and it's not a works for salvation. And I'm not saying you should turn your back, but we all have turned our back on God. And I never lost my salvation, because it's Jesus Christ holding on to me, and it's the Father holding on to me, and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's always by grace. But we read here in Lament, Lamentations 3.25, and he says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. So here, they're waiting. They know he's coming. They're looking for him every day. As we look for the rapture to come, they were waiting for the coming Messiah. To the soul that seeketh him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. They were looking for the coming Messiah. Turn over to Psalm 62. Back over to Proverbs by Proverbs. So Psalm 62, 1. My wife posted this on Facebook uh, not long ago, and it says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. The individuals in the Old Testament were looking for the coming Messiah. And here we see in 1 Samuel, they were they went up. And made offerings of faith. They were looking for that Messiah. We drop down to 1 Samuel 1, 4, 5. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Paniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. For he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut her womb. Even though Hannah had not had child with Elkanah, it's important to note that he loved her first. He loved her, and then you know what he gave her? He gave her a worthy portion, a worthy portion. And we see today, we see a reverse role of that. We see today women getting pregnant, and then we see them trying to come together and love. And that might be a problem. That might be why we have a divorce rate of 50%, California 75%. Those are documented divorce rates. We should love each other first, love our spouse then come together to make child. But you know what? When I read that, I also saw something else. I could definitely see Christ, Jesus Christ. You know, he loved us, and then he gave us a worthy portion. Turn over to Revelations 1.5. Turn over to back to the end of the Bible here. Revelations 1.5. It tells us how he loved us, and then he gave us a worthy portion here. And he says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He loved 
Hannah, and he gave her a worthy portion. And we always see that love is actionable. It's a verb. You could see love. And we see it today. We love many times about love this or love you, this and that. But ultimately, when it comes right down to it, probably not a love, not a biblical love happening through the world. Because if we turn over to Romans 5, 8, we again see love demonstrated. Romans 5, 8. But God commanded, God demonstrated his love towards us in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So over and over we see in the Bible, we read that love and we receive this worthy portion. And hopefully you can see that, you know what, your law loved. God loved you before you were even created by your mom and dad. God loved, he knew you were going to ultimately be have life in this world, and he still went to the cross for each and every one of you, and he died for each and every one of you. He paid for all of your sins, past, present, future, and he was buried, and he resurrected the third day, and hopefully you all receive the worthy portion of eternal life, because there's nothing better than knowing you're going to heaven when you die. Let's turn back to 1 Samuel again. Verses uh, 6 through 8. And her adversary, so we can see here the her other wife in the family here. And her adversary also provoked her sore. For to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So we can see how the family members, you know, the, they can be sometimes be pretty mean. And as he did so year by year, and she went up by the house of the Lord, and she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. This was not a, just a one-time deal. It says year by year they went up, offered up these thanksgivings of offerings, and looking for the coming Messiah. And yet, you know what, Hannah, she never lost faith. But yet we see the other wife continuing to provoke her. Elkanah loves me more, and this and that. And I have many kids, and you have none. And ultimately... Hannah was, you know, feeling pretty bad there. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her Hannah, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy grief heart grieved? Am not I better than ten sons? Hannah was heartbroken and grieved heavenly because she could not have a child. And it bothered her so much. She was so stressed. She could not even eat. It had an effect on her health. And we can see how that happens to us today. Stress, one of the worst things probably for us. It affects our health, it affects if we eat, it affects if we sleep. And ultimately we're gonna see from a young lady how we should handle stress. Let's look at 1 Samuel uh, 1, 9 through 10. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And, he, and she was in the bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So Hannah's heart was heavily, was very heavy, and she grieved. But what did she do? What did she do? She, you know what? She prayed. She went to the temple, and ultimately we know that she prayed and prayed unto the Lord. And you know what? We can boldly go to the throne of grace herself. And we should go to the boldly, the gold, boldly to the throne of grace every single day. We should pray for ourselves. We should pray for other people. But ultimately, we know we should go boldly to the throne of grace. Because we have a mediator. We have an intercessor in heaven that ultimately that mediates and he intercesses on our behalf every single day to the Father. First, he mediates us for salvation. And then he intercesses also. He is the high priest. And he intercesses as only he can at the cross of Calvary. If, you, if you're know what verses those are, but let's turn over to Hebrews 4, 16 first, because I want you to see how you can boldly go to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4, 16. And we can learn this from a young lady here. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. You, don't, you shouldn't have access to God, but you know what? You do. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's foolish for us to think that we can do it on our own, that we can live by faith and do it all. You know, I'm saved for the saved person 
and ultimately, you know, I'm going to push through it myself. But as a saved child, you know what? I've learned, I've tried to do it myself, and ultimately, not for salvation, but just fellowship. I need Jesus Christ and my Father every single day. I want to read to them. I want to, I want to hear his word. I want to have fellowship. I want him to talk to me, and it is through his word. And I boldly go to that, to that throne of grace every single day. What an honor we have as children of God. And if you're not saved, you can have that honor. Turn over to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And if you're trusting in your works for salvation, rituals or sacraments, look at the Bible. Don't trust me, but read. look at the words in the Bible because in 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 5, we have Timothy who was a pastor of Ephesus. These are pastoral epistles. And he says, who will have all men to be saved? Jesus Christ wants all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of truth. And what does Satan do? He tries to hide the gospel. It is lost to them that are lost. It is hid to them that are lost. And he wants to keep it hid to them. You got to come and hear it. You got to understand that you're not good enough. You'll never ever make it. And he paid for all sin because he wants all men to be saved. Look at verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, and man, Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 7. We talk about the high priest. There's two types of priests in the Old Testament. Well, there's... There's the Arianic priesthood. If you know anything about the Levites there and the Leviticus, we have the Arianic priesthood, Aaron, Moses' brother. And when they offered up sacrifices, and you know what? It was a constant reminder that they're sinners. Then we have a different priesthood. It's called the, the priesthood of Melchizedek. And it's documented in Genesis 14. There's a man in, Mel in Genesis 14 that walks on the page of scriptures and then he walks off. He has no beginning and he has no end. Until we come to Hebrews here, it talks more about Melchizedek. And it is speaking of Christ. And we read in Hebrews chapter 7 there and verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they... Hey, they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. It is not beyond his power to save. He can save us to the uttermost. Guaranteed salvation that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for him. We live because Christ is. He sits at the right hand of the Father today, and he's a constant reminder that sin's paid in full, and that's a constant reminder that he makes intercessory prayer for us all the time, for salvation and as a child of God. 26, for such an high priest became us who is bold, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. There was no sin in him because he is God who needed not daily as those high priests, the Arianic priesthood, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins like the Arianic priesthoods and then the, people, then the peoples for this he did once when he offered up himself. He died one time for the sins of mankind. He was God. He is God. Revealed him in the flesh and ultimately went to the cross. Took the sins of the world. Paid a perfect sacrifice and he has risen today. 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. This young lady went to the bully through the throne of grace. And we won. If you're not saved, why not trust in Jesus Christ? It's like that light switch and that light. If there is no wire to that light switch and you flip that switch, that light will not turn on. But you need copper wire running from that switch to that light switch. And ultimately, that's what gives us light. And we see the Father, we see us, and that, that, that line, that mediator is Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings us back into favor. Man will never bring us back into favor. Our works will never bring us back into favor. It is Jesus Christ reaching down the sinner man 
and him holding on to the Father. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. So why not for salvation trust in Jesus Christ? And as a child of God, why not go boldly to the throne of grace every single day where he can mediate and intercess on our behalf and where we can have peace in our lives, even when we're going through stress and turmoil. Romans 8, look at Romans 8, 28 through 34. And we know that all things work together for good to know to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We know that God works everything for good. My mom lost a child. Mom, it's Mother's Day. That baby was two and a half years old. Her name was Carrie Lee. My, my mom mourned, she was hospitalized, she went into great depression, and ultimately mourned and cried and grieved. Why God, why God did you take my own, my, my, one of my children? And today my mom's like, you know what? My mom actually says, thank God. Thank God he took my child. God works all things for good. At the time I was like, my mom's like, how can there be a God? How can he take my child? Yet, through Carrie dying, it was a revelation how we could then see Christ. It, my mom and dad finally understood salvation was a free gift. And God intervened and took their child, and that child went to heaven. And what a blessing. Didn't have to take a 25-year-old child like when I was way older. No, took a child, and they will forever be with that child. You can see grace wrapped around this whole thing. It's an amazing thing. Oh God, he works all things for good. Mom and dad got saved, we later got saved. So we can see that, and we, there's so many times that we question him, why is he doing this? Well, you know what, he, God works all things for good, and sometimes we don't understand that. 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Predestined, not that he predestined anybody to heaven or hell, but ultimately before the creation of the world, world was made, before he blew life into man, spoke life into man, the process of salvation was predestined. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. And Jesus is calling today. The call is out to everybody. Have you received him? Have you picked it up? Have you heard it? Because we're running out of time. If you've not trusted him, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You're right. As a child of God, who, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And again, you can see the gospel, the, the scarlet thread of redemption is intertwined through the word of God, all the way throughout the word of God. And here we see again the gospel. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And as a father in heaven, he wants to give us things according to his will and his purpose to bring glory to him. Remember that. Not earthly things and fleshly things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody will. Nobody. Because I'm perfect in Christ. I'm seen as righteous as Christ. It is God that justifieth. And if he says that I'm free, then I'm free indeed, is what John 8 says. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yet rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of the God, who also maketh intercession for us. Jesus Christ mediates, intercedes for salvation, for only Jesus Christ can pay the perfect sacrifice for sin. And also Jesus Christ intercedes on the behalf of all saints and makes our prayers and petitions known. We go on to 1 Samuel 1.11. And she bowed a bow and said, O Lord of hosts, so she's in there making prayer. She makes a promise to God. She's like, you know what? If you, Lord, if you give me a child, this is what I'll do. If thou wilt indeed look, a, look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come unto his head. And should not all moms have that prayer petition when they make the decision to bring a child into the world. She's going to raise that child on the foundation of Christ. You know what she promises here? She promises a Nazarene vow. Not that we should do Numbers chapter 6 where we let the hair all grow, things like that. Not saying that. 
We live in different dispensation today, but ultimately we grow in grace. But you know, if you want to understand the, uh, uh, the Nazarene vow, turn over to Numbers chapter 6. It's given to us. His mom could not get pregnant, and she made a promise. And what, and what all moms should ultimately raise their kids on the gospel. What mom would want their child to go to hell? I don't, I don't, I don't know, not one. But it is their responsibility as a dad, you know, and let the truth, the knowledge of truth be shared with them. Look at Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 through, just verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When neither man or woman shall have separate themselves to bow about an, of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. And you know, Jesus is, Jesus is of Nazareth. And if you lived in Nazareth, you were, you were a Nazarite. Look at Numbers 6, verse 13. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering on the Lord. One, he lamb of the first year without blemish, a burnt offering started back in Genesis chapter 3. And a new lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. One ram without blemish for peace offering. And you can see that the Nazarene vow all pointed to Jesus Christ. It all pointed to the cross of Calvary. And we read in Mark 16, 6, And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, he's risen, he's not here. Behold the place where he laid himself. And that's what I said, where Jesus is of Nazareth. He was a Nazarite, and ultimately he fulfilled the Nazarite vow. We read over in Hebrews 7, 23 through 28, to be separated from sin because he knew no sin. He's a perfect sacrifice. There was no sin in him. And ultimately he came to become sin for us that we might be saved because only God can make a perfect sacrifice. And I wrote, I said, mothers, when the Lord gives you a child, you should separate your child by raising him on the gospel of Christ. Separate. Sanctified is what it means. What a beautiful verse. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, 10. By the which we are all sanctified, separated, separated, set apart. By the which we're all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Give him the, and ultimately, if she made this, no razor will come to his head. We know that a Nazarene was to separate, and that's exactly what we see here. This mom, ultimately, she was going to raise his child, that he would be separated from the world. He would not look like the world. And ultimately, he was sanctified in the body of Christ. And when we preach the gospel to our children, they are sanctified in the body of Christ. They're separated in the body of Christ. They're set apart in the body of Christ. Mothers, your child is not to be separated by water baptism. Your child is not to be separated by communion, confirmation, or following the Ten Commandments. Mothers, your child is separated. They're set apart. They're made holy in the body of Jesus Christ. And how do you get in the body of Jesus Christ? It is trusting that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he resurrected for you. We should all be motivated like Hannah. Fathers too. That we would pray the petition. If you give me a child, Father. If you give me the, the responsibility to raise this child in this world. In an awful, ultimately an evil world. I will make sure I share the gospel with this child. How important is the gospel? It's all important. As a mother, you have a responsibility to raise your child on the gospel of Christ. Let's turn back to 1 Samuel. We're going to read the rest about Hannah. <laughs> and it came to pass as I continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He could see her mouth. It looked like she was mumbling something there. He thought she was drunk. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. And you know what? That's interesting. God knows who's trusted him. Psalm 44, 21, I think it is. He knows who trusted him. Nahum 1, 7 says that. But Psalm 44, I think 21, he knows 
He searches our hearts out. He knows what we're trusting in for salvation. So you can verbally say this stuff, but ultimately he knows what you're trusting in. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunk. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of the sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint, grief have I spoken hitherto. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So, so the woman went her way and did eat. So now we see her eat. She finally has peace. She went to the bold, boldly to the throne of grace, and she departed her stress. She gave it to God. She did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Her face, you could see it. She let that stress go. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to her house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his wife went up to the offer unto the Lord, the yearly sacrifice of his vow, but Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. Her response was that child. She, took, she nurtured it, took care of it. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode, gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks, one ephah of flour, and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Here we are, Shiloh again. The picture of Christ. And the child was young. Look at her bringing up, bringing out a drink offering. And we know the drink offering is Matthew 26. How in verse 39 and 40 and 41, how ultimately the father filled his cup full. And we know that it was only other way that Christ had to go to the cross. And we, so we can see Christ in here all the time. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as the soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed, and the Lord which gaveth me my portion, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. And you know what? There is no greater babysitter than Jesus Christ. There's no greater babysitter than our Father in Heaven. Because, you know, as a father of myself and my wife, we could not keep our eyes on our children at all times. We had to let them go out into the world. They went to school. They went to work. They did these things. And I love the attitude of Hannah. He says, therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. Pray for our kids and lend them to the Lord because there's no greater, no better babysitter than him. And as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. And we know the rock that was documented in Daniel. It is a rock carved not of hands. And we know in 1 Corinthians that rock is Jesus Christ. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let no arrogancy come out of your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by Him actions are weighed. The bows, the bows of the mighty men are broken and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease, so that they bear and have both seven, and she that hath many children is grown feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave, and he bringeth up. You know there's two resurrections, right? There's a resurrection of the dead, and there's a resurrection of the living. Which resurrection are you going to attend? Because we know the resurrection of the living is the ones that trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's it. The resurrection of the dead is talked about in John chapter 5, and we know it's documented in Revelation chapter 20. The resurrection of the dead is you'll stand before God at the white throne judgment, and you will be judged according to your works, and you will be cast in the lake of fire for all eternity, because your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Man, 
He raises up the poor out of the dust, lifted up the beggar from the dunghill. Man, that's exactly what he does for us. And he sets them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Lord's, and he that set the world upon them, he will keep the feet of his saints. He keeps the feet of his saints. He's the one that's holding on us. We don't hold on to Christ. He keeps the feet of his saints. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. It's interesting that they'll be silent in darkness because there'll be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Probably won't be a whole lot of crying out. I don't know what wailing and gnashing of teeth, but they probably won't be doing a lot of talking. The wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. By no man's strength. There's no man's rituals. There's no man's sacraments. The thing of it is, Galatians 2.21, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ dead and died in vain. If you could earn salvation, then why did Jesus Christ come to die on the cross? That's the question that we should be asking, because there's no other way. The adversary of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. And we know the adversary, the devil, adversary of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Remember his position. He is God Almighty. He is the Most High God. And he speaks from heaven. He doesn't speak from earth. And shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. He shall give strength unto the king and exalt the horn of his anointed. This is the prayer of Hannah, a young woman. And we can see in the scriptures there how amazing what she was looking to. And as moms, again, to have your child separated, set apart, sanctified, anointed by the Most High God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, all received in Jesus Christ. And we'll close on the Mother's Day message here. I say, raise the child on the gospel of Christ, and they will not depart because they are eternally secure. Once a child grows up and understands what mom has done for them, when he's old, and ultimately, you know what he'll say? She is blessed. Because at the end of the day, when you have a mom that said, you know what, no, you're going to go to, you're going to go to camp. No, you're going to, you need to know that it's all by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're going to be like, one day you'll be like, man, that woman is blessed. Thank God I had a mom that ultimately searched it out. And she knew the scriptures and she knew she wanted me to hear the gospel of Christ. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart. Proverbs 31, 28, her children will rise up and call her blessed. If you have a mom that has shared the gospel with you, you are blessed. We are blessed. Thank God for moms. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. Father, again, we just want to thank you for Christ. So thankful that you love the sinners the way we are and that you sent your beloved Son to the cross of Calvary to die on the cross for our sins, to be buried and resurrect the third day, showing us the pain for sin, paid in full. Nothing we can do to earn salvation, not of works. Salvation is not a partnership. It's not believe and get baptized, believe and take communion. It's not believe and do work good. No, it's not. God knows our heart. Are we trusting in him alone? That because it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, documented in the scriptures alone, so God gets the glory alone. And maybe here today, somebody's like, you know what, that makes sense. Right now, I want to give that opportunity to be like, you know what, right now, God knows your heart. He's searching it out right now. What are you trusting in? What are you clinging on to? Are you clinging on to your works? Right now, you can be like, you know what, no, Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, and he resurrected for me. I'm trusting in that and that alone. The Father knows your heart. If you're simply trusting in him and him alone, in Christ, believe that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and resurrected for you, and that's it, you can be like, Father, thank you, because you've been born again. It is that easy. And Father, to your children here, that we would not forget that we can boldly access the throne of grace, just like Hannah did, that we're reminded that we have a a brother in heaven, a savior, a father who mediates and intercedes on our behalf that he works all things for good to bring glory unto him. And what an honor it is for God to work in our lives and to mediate and intercede on our behalf. And Father, you know what? We want to thank our moms today. Just want to just uh, give them an extra blessing today because the moms around the world, they are blessed. The moms 
that share the gospel with their children and raise them on the gospel are blessed. Let us enjoy the day. Bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.